In 2017, an increasing number of companies reported they did not have effective insider threat detection methods. Logarithms UEBA solutions enable you to detect and neutralize user-based threats in real time, while built-in scenario and behavior-based analytics empower you to expose insider threats, compromised accounts, and privilege misuse. Visit Logarithm.com to learn how their UEBA solutions can help you expand visibility and enhance detection capabilities. Domain tools help security analysts turn threat data into threat intelligence. They take indicators from your network, including domains and IP addresses, and connect them with nearly every active domain on the internet. Those connections drive risk assessments, help profile attackers, guide online fraud investigations, and map cyber activity to attacker infrastructure. Fortune 1000 companies, global government agencies, and leading security solutions vendors use the domain tools platform as a critical ingredient in their threat investigations and proactive defenses. For more information, visit securityweekly.com forward slash domain tools. The greatest threat to businesses today isn't the outsider trying to get in. It's the people you trust, the ones who already have the keys, your employees, your contractors, and privileged users. 60% of online attacks are carried out by insiders. To stop these insider threats, you need to see what users are doing before an incident occurs. Observe it combats insider threats by detecting risk activity, investigating in minutes, effectively responding, and stopping data lost. Give it a test drive at observeit.com forward slash security weekly. Today's determined attackers easily bypass even the most advanced network defenses. Trying to ramp up staff to detect their back doors can cost thousands of dollars and take months, even years. With Active Countermeasures AI Hunter, we enable junior analysts to detect even the most advanced back doors in a matter of hours. Sign up for a demo and purchase our product today by visiting activecountermeasures.com forward slash ESW. Active Countermeasures, make every analyst a hunter. Are you looking for high-performance data storage that's easy to use yet secure enough for the Department of Defense? Look no further. Racktop Systems gives business software-defined data storage complete with embedded compliance, security, and data encryption. Don't let cyber threats, regulatory demands, or the complexity and growth of your data overwhelm your business. Racktop's high-performance data management platform gives you the tools you need to address the most demanding data challenges. Think beyond storage. To learn more, visit racktopsystems.com. Welcome back, everyone, to Enterprise Security Weekly. If you're attending the upcoming DerbyCon Security Conference in Louisville, Kentucky, you can attend the Mental Health and Wellness Workshop. Uh, our very own Keith Hoodlet will be presenting there. The fabulous uh, Amanda Berlin is, I believe, heading up the effort at DerbyCon, so make sure you stop by and support our uh, community in the aspect of mental health and wellness. All righty, Matt. We are going to talk about the enterprise security news. Not a lot of stories, but I thought there were some pretty good ones. And we're leading in with an announcement from Proofpoint, who purchased Wombat Security uh, earlier this year. Or it must have been February. earlier this year. Yeah. Yeah. It's February. Because they were in the booth. Wombat was in the booth next to us at InfoSec World, and they had like just been acquired uh, the, the previous month or so. So. Um, it's interesting. I think Proofpoint, my assessment of this, and we'll talk about some of the details, is Proofpoint's trying to play catch up in the market. I think they're losing out on a lot of their renewal business and they're having a customer retention problem. I think they recognize that and that's why they were acquiring companies like Wombat to strengthen their portfolio for customer retention and to go out and get new business and be more competitive in the market as there's so many options now for email phishing uh, protection. Yeah, I think that one of the challenges with Proofpoint is they kind of went really, really wide, right? They kind of the core business was email, but then they started adding yeah. social media and all these other products and almost lost focus a little bit on mm -hmm. the core email business, right? Yes. That is important. And without those renewals, what are you cross selling to, right? Yeah, and so, yeah exactly. Yeah. <laughs> it, anybody who's been in the SaaS business knows the core customer base is important. If you forget them, mm -hmm. then it's really hard to cross sell new offerings to if you start to lose the base. So in this particular case, they go out, they buy Wombat. What I like about this is we just talked about this a little bit with Bandura in the previous segment is automation, mm -hmm. right? Closing the loop, right? This is one of these things that we I heard from customers all the time when I was at Tenable. Just give me a simple closed loop process, right? So here it's all around closed loop email analysis and, and this concept of remediation is can I now, when I see a phishing attack, actually automate aspects of the remediation and kind of close that loop and make it a little easier to deal with these phishing attacks, leveraging some of the, the capabilities from the Wombat acquisition. 
Yeah, it's interesting. Uh, Logarithm did a webcast with us, uh, had to be last year even, or a while ago, uh, and they released uh, an open source project that, and one of the capabilities that, that I was particularly enamored with was when users are in their inbox, in whatever the platform is, Logarithm I think was specific to uh, Office 365 perhaps, or uh, Exchange, one of the two, and when an email sees something that they suspect is phishing, it's as simple as clicking a button. And then, the pro- like you said, the automation the automation takes place. Now, you have to couple that with some awareness training, which I think is some of what Wombat uh, also does as well, is in- integrate some of that awareness training, I, I believe. Um, and once they have some of that training, they they know which emails to click that button on. Um, which, I mean, that and that today now has become table stakes very quickly. Yeah, because it makes it really easy. When you see the first one come through, you hurry up, you, you get the ability to respond to it right away. And these solutions then go through the inboxes and pull them out before somebody else can click on the link, right? Again, I mean, this is a technology how- when the I love you and Melissa viruses were coming, were e- email born. Like I walked into work one day and it was chaos in 2000. Even before that, I think it was even before 2001 where some of these first email born uh, campaigns mm-hmm. were coming out. And everyone was like, what the hell do we do? And now the technology, I'm like, where was this technology, you know, 20 years ago or whatever, uh, where the first user can see it, <clears throat> an analyst through an orchestration and automation platform can say, yes, that's a real threat. By the way, now go pull it out from everyone's inbox before they even get into work in the morning. Dude, right. And so I just, awesome. I just reduce my infections by like drastic yeah. numbers. Yeah. 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 And it Completely stops different. the problem from escalating, right? The problem with uh, those early email born viruses was that escalation point as the users opened it and it would then go to everyone in their address book, right? It was kind of like the, the Sammy Camcar MySpace attack. Like it, everyone who he friended, it would automatically friend all their friends and he took down right. MySpace and actually um, w- was prosecuted for that um, and recovered. He's an awesome researcher today, but it's the same kind of problem, right? If these infections escalate you've you've now get to the point where everyone has to stop what they're doing in the entire it organization and even outside of that in the legal department and in whatever everyone has to stop you can now prevent that pretty easily and as i said it's like a table stakes feature simple close the loop guys yep uh speaking of security uh orchestration and automation demisto has released a report on the state of orchestration and automation um i think largely stating the obvious right i don't know if you yeah, read, read through this report I but I, I was there was nothing really and, and I, I like demisto i like the space uh and we can comment at that in a, in a minute but you know the report was kind of like give me a hook give me something that's going to compel me to maybe take an action or think about the problem and the solution differently and i just i didn't get that so we don't need a report when Splunk buys Phantom for a gajillion dollars, sure. right? We know, I mean, the we know space it's a is thing. real. Yes. We, we, we know it's that. a thing, right? Yeah. I, I don't need a survey to tell me mm-hmm. why uh, Splunk bought Phantom, for example, right? I mean, this, this space has been evolving for a while. Uh, the need for orchestration automation, I think people know. It, to your point, okay, now what? Yeah. So what? Tell me why Demisto. What do I do now? Tell me why yeah. I should consider Demisto over all of the other options oh. in in the market today. And I, and I don't want to knock Demisto in any way, shape, form, or fashion. They very well could have that. Um, but tell us about it. Yeah, exactly. Show me the value yeah. of Demisto with these results to say, okay, how do we help you with this orchestration automation problem? Um, because, like I said, it, it it's front and center. Uh, acquisitions are happening in this space. We know it's a hot area. I want to know why Demisto and not somebody else personally um, versus just a bunch of generic survey results. The larger question for me, and if I were the CISO of an organization and we've got the, you know, anywhere from 20 to 40 or more security products, right? And I'm trying to integrate them together and apply uh, uh, automation orchestration. My question as a CISO is, do I need a standalone product that gives me automation and orchestration, or am I strategically um, acquiring solutions that have that built into it already? And, and, and that's where I'm curious to see where this market goes. Are there going to be the standalone players, or are they going to largely be, like in the Splunk case, part of some other kind of solution 
that it's it's just not a standalone thing anymore. Yeah, I mean, innovation starts with a whole new segment. Mm -hmm. It comes forward, right? There's innovation done. And then you see the adjacency markets go, yes. oh, yeah, that'd be really cool to have it in my product, right? And you, yep. you know, FireEye made an acquisition in the space. Sure. Threat Connect uh, has added that uh, capability to their capability. portfolio. Our, our rapid, sponsor, rapid, uh, DF Labs. Yeah, Rapid7 yep. bought Command, too. Yeah, right? early I on, mean, Rapid7 saw the space. And yeah. I tell you what, I give, and rapid Seven's a sponsor. Put that aside for a moment. I give Rapid7 a lot of credit because they were a, a very early acquirer of this technology and bought command at a very early I mean, they were a seed funded, very small startup. And I got a glimpse of their technology and in the blink of an eye, Rapid7 had gobbled them up. It was a great strategic move. For, they had great vision in that acquisition. Uh, and I applaud the yeah. team for that. Um, yeah, well, it was part of our strategy at one point at Tenable, but sure. didn't that strategy, right? We looked at those players as well. And then mm -hmm. Splunk picks up Phantom and, you know, so this market's moving, right? And and I think what the larger enterprise security vendors see is that having some of these orchestration automation capabilities built into them has value to organizations so they don't have to buy a standalone solution and do a bunch of integration points. Splunk has a ton of integration points yeah. already. It, by buying Phantom and, and bringing that capability into the platform, it makes it really easy for an enterprise CISO to go, look, I've already got Splunk. I, I, it's all right here. Mm -hmm. um, so, so yeah, I mean, the question is the demistos, the swim lanes, the cyber responses, mm -hmm. you know, what's the future for them as more of these enterprise software companies, are, these vendors already have some of this capability now built sure. in. Sure. And in the case with DF Labs, Matt, who's a sponsor, you know, the show is they've got an incident response and forensics platform and a very strong player in that market. Now, if I'm the CISO and either I don't have that or I want to replace that and I can replace it with something that also gives me the capability of orchestration and automation. To me, I think that's an overlooked kind of marriage of those two technologies because when you look at orchestrating and automating something, your ultimate goal is to have some type of response, an instant response, and it, then if it's, it's really bad, heavily, do the forensics, yeah. right? Like it, it's really yeah. in line, but it leaves the enterprise security teams with a lot of decisions to be made as to how they're going to integrate and implement these technologies. And it, it could be a case where I really think my prediction is it's different strokes for different folks, right? I think there's some organizations that are going to say, look, I need a standalone platform because of my architecture. There's others that are going to go, look, I really have this need for instant response and forensics, and I want the automation orchestration to come along with that. And then there's others that are going to be like, well, we have Splunk, so we're going to, we're going to use that. And I think it's going to continue like that for some time. It will, but but you're right. It, this is tied closely to incident response. And so if you're looking at building out and improving your incident response, your security operations mm -hmm. center, these are all technologies that you're going to look at because yep. they're they're heavily um, linked together as driving that incident response forensics uh, kind of process. Yep, absolutely. Fun stuff. Uh, let's see, uh, one login and Netscope partner to expand, expand cloud security for enterprises. Now I understand what one login does. Netscope is a cloud security, uh, company, I believe Ac cloud, cloud access security broker. Okay, I yawned sorry, Caspi. On, okay. on that one. Cause okay. this is, to, this to me is a yawn. I, I'll, I, I got to read the line because, um, it, it's great because empowers organizations to easily discover and govern sanctioned cloud services and activities. Um, hmm. Hello, folks. We've been talking about shadow IT and cloud for a long time. Yeah, what about a lot of this stuff ain't sanctioned. Yeah, exactly. exactly. <laughs> right? yeah. it, it, look, I'm not a big fan of CASBs. I never have been. Mm -hmm. And there's one reason. is, And this was part of our thesis when we were doing research at Tenable. I'm taking the entire internet and trying to connect it to the entire internet and you can't shove it through a little straw. Yeah. Whether it's CASB, VPN, whatever, it just it does not scale. The future is allowing devices to connect to cloud devices uninhibited and not forcing them through these things. So I, I'm just I'm not a big fan of these kinds of announcements because there is so much stuff happening outside in the cloud world that's never going to be seen by these technologies. It, it just um I'm kind of over with Caspi's. Sorry, folks. I just am. Uh, speaking of being over with things, like I, I thought I was over with, with BlackBerry. It's interesting when we first started the podcast um, in 2005, 
BlackBerry was still a player, a large player in the smart, I guess you could call it a smartphone back then, right? Um, and very heavy on the enterprise side, right? Like if you were an enterprise, you likely had, you were issuing Blackberries to your employees and you had the Blackberry enterprise server on your network uh, and they had a huge market share. Uh, and that I, I think very quickly eroded. Like if I fast forward uh, to where I was in like 2007 when I got my first iPhone, right? It was working at Ocean. Um, that's when it just, it quickly started to erode. Now what's interesting is BlackBerry, I don't know exactly what they're doing. I haven't taken a, a briefing yet, but I, I have been seeing some various news outlets uh, and, and PR uh, about BlackBerry basically getting into the security market I, is what I'm seeing as they're uh, promoting their new enterprise of things uh, platform and their line is designed and built for ultra secure, hyper connectivity from the kernel to the edge. I don't know what that means, but it sounds good. I uh, yeah, I don't know either. It, I um I had to pull up their stock price just to take a look at it because you're right. In the early days from a smartphone, it was all about secure communication, security. Federal government used a ton of Blackberries. Enterprises used a Blackberry because they were secure. Mm -hmm. iPhone came, came out and it was all about usability, ease Features of use. use. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, exactly. And, and their market share went to like 4% in the mobile space, right? And mm -hmm. so you want to talk about Microsoft who missed the mobile revolution, yep. you know, BlackBerry kind of just completely ignored it, <laughs> just yeah, ignore it. I mean, they had it and then they just let it go, right? Mm -hmm. It just fell through their fingers. Um, but I look at the stock and, it, and I'm like, is it, it are they viable? It, the yeah. stock really hasn't done anything. It's really flat over the past five years. I mean, mm -hmm. if you go look at a five-year chart, 10 to 10, it, it's flat. I mean, there's... Mm -hmm. There's nothing happening here. You look at Apple over the last five years, you know, 50, something like 56% of the revenue comes from iPhone. Look at that stock over the last five yeah. years. I mean, innovation's happening at Apple. It's not happening at BlackBerry. I'm sorry. It just, it's it's I, true. They missed out on the innovation. Um, but it seems like they're they're trying to now address the problem and, and come back into the market and have some kind of security play, which is interesting. We'll see. We'll see. I, I you know, do... Will they have the mind share? Will people yeah. even give them a chance anymore? I, I don't know. I think most people are, are past BlackBerry and they've moved on. And look, we've got MDMs and MAMs and all kinds of stuff on the mobile side to protect these devices. Does does anybody care anymore? I, I, I don't know. I yeah, don't. But it, I, and if it's not mobile, I mean, we've got a lot of technology for IoT devices today that's being uh, integrated into a lot of security vendors. Uh, Fortinet's messaging on that today. Um, what's the NAC provider? I always get it wrong because it's not it's not Fort Force, Scale. Yeah. Four Scout. Four Scout. Yes, Force Four Scout. Scouts uh, messaging heavily on that uh, as well. So yeah, and you're going to see a ton of uh, evolution on IoT and Edge, and you know, even from the cloud providers. I mean, this this space is going to be uh, innovating and evolving for a while. Um, I don't think anybody's got the niche on iot and edge yet but there's going to be some major mm. continued moves in the space I, I again I, I look at it and i go it it's not blackberry sorry it just yeah it's not yeah uh, unless they really impress us with with a briefing or something and we're, we're missing something but remains to be seen it wasn't at this point. It, it wasn't in that press release let's put it that way yes this is true um security scorecard well, it, now, they say they're a leader in security ratings. What does that mean, Matt? So this is this interesting uh, kind of external digital risk um, area, right? It, yeah, It's third-party third, risk. third party risk management. It's external. I wouldn't say just third-party. It's mm -hmm. external. So what – and there's a, a few companies here. you got Risk IQ, um, Security Scorecard. Oh, okay. So they're in that um, space with digital shadows. and Yeah, kind yeah, of. Okay. Yeah. I mean, what they're doing is they're looking at external posture mm -hmm. of your environment and then scoring it. Um, BitSight's the other one in this yes, space, right? Yes. And, and so they're they're doing external discovery, looking at um, those, those devices, and then based on vulnerabilities – threats and some other stuff, they, they put a score on it, right? Mm -hmm. And people use that scorecard as a way to gauge the potential risk of doing business with that company. It could be third party or not third party, right? I've seen 
these scores get integrated into third-party risk management platforms like CyberGRX okay. yep. or some of okay. the GRC platforms. That's the right? tie-in. I was going to ask that. Yeah, so that's the tie-in. Yeah, right. That's the tie-in. So it, it, it but it's one. Some it's one factor. Context. It, it, here's it's, my it's here's my one. issue. Yeah, it's one. So if I'm looking to I don't know partner uh, a merger acquisition with a company. And I, I go to security scorecard in this example, right? And I get their external risk score. That just tells me about like what's publicly available on the internet. So that means they could be absolutely atrocious, but still have really secure software, right? <laughs> that they're doing. Or they could have a really good external threat score, but they haven't implemented any security in their SDLC. It, it doesn't tell me about a lot of other factors that go into... Um, the the overall risk score of an organization. Correct. It is one factor. Um, and that's why you see them integrated in with other third-party risk platforms like gotcha. CyberGRX okay. and some yeah. of the GRCs because what those solutions are doing are looking at all the internal controls mm -hmm. and now you have this external component and the two of them together start to paint a broader picture of the overall third-party risk. I, I I don't think it's one or the other. The interesting part of this announcement, though, that I do like, I, I mean, like I said, it's, it, they're competing with a few in this space, but the, the planner and the event log are a couple interesting features that they announced. That's what's in this uh, press release. And that is, well, what if I change this? How does it impact my score? So if you mm -hmm. think about this from an enterprise and you see that you're, you don't have a, a good um, security scorecard score, this now allows you to say, well, if I do this, if I do that, does it improve my score? Or doesn't mm -hmm. it? Um, which is interesting for an enterprise to kind of do a um, kind of uh, a, a prioritization of where they can improve their scores. The other thing, this event log capability was as changes are being made, you can actually track uh, the history of those changes and how they've impacted your scores. Mm -hmm. So it's a couple interesting features when you think about it from a enterprise wanting to understand their external risk footprint and what can they do to improve it so it looks mm -hmm. better. These are a couple interesting announcements and, and features that that they announced in this press release. Yeah, and I like that too because you know likely with your your external footprint, there could be relatively easy things that you could do that could have a dramatic impact on your score. I mean, it could also go the other way, but I, it, when I look at the external, like I looked at the external footprint of Security Weekly, right? And I made some small changes that I thought had a big impact. And then there were other things I'm like, well, that's a lot more work, but it's going to have little impact on the external footprint and, and overall risk. So yeah, that that is important yep. though. And, yeah. And that's where it helps you. Red Seal uh, launches remote administrator managed service to augment customer security teams and make network situational awareness more widely available. That that's their title. That's a really lo they're saying a lot right right in the title, Matt. So they what, are, and and I'm like, uh, what does that mean? So we looked at we looked at Red this. Seal before, right? What? Yeah, I've, I've looked I've looked at them a couple times in my past. And this is, is it somewhat similar to what we're just talking about? Is this more like looking at your attack paths potentially? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I mean, yeah. You know, they, they call, there's an, there's this interesting overlap coming with um, what I would consider traditional threat vulnerability management vendors like Kenna, mm -hmm. RiskSense, Nopsec that sit on top of the VM vendors and what these Red Seal Skybox Core is doing, which is mm -hmm. visualization of the network and overlying vulnerabilities, that when when you talk to analysts and I talk to a bunch of them, you, you they kind of intermix the two, and you have to educate them on what do the Kenna's Risk Sense Nopsecs of the world yeah. do versus the Red Seal Skybox and and uh, Cores do of the world because they're they're different. And you um, need you need both, you know, right? You need to understand. Yeah. You, yeah you, you really need both yeah. in, in particular cases, right? What Red Seal and, and these technologies are really good at is kind of visualizing attack paths in the network by overlaying vulnerability data on top of network uh, connectivity data that they already have. Mm -hmm. That's what these guys are really good at. They all came out of the firewall management space and have a lot of network data. They overlay it with vulnerability data. And now you can start to identify um, pinch points in the network. Yep. And um, so you need a... A, a solid vulnerability management platform, right? Correct. And, and program 
to identify as many of the vulnerabilities as you can find, then you need the kind of risk sense nopsecs of the world to help you prioritize and make sense of that remediation and inject compensating controls and other things into that risk equation to help you prioritize it. But then you need like the red seals and the sky boxes of the world that tell you about what, what paths are likely, which also plays into your risk and, and remediation prioritization. Correct. So that's, that's the, the market, right? Mm -hmm. So what is this announcement? This announcement is, hey, we will give you a resource as part of a managed service to keep your environment updated so you can actually leverage those prioritizations. Mm -hmm. So when you really dig into that, this is really this remote administration managed service is really getting a body from Red Seal to manage your environment to keep it up to date. So it sounds like, you know, some they, they are seeing challenges with their customers keeping this data fresh mm -hmm. to really um, figure out what those right prioritizations are. So Red Seal says, fine, buy this body from us. We'll help you keep it updated. And therefore, you can leverage the data on a more uh, regular basis instead of once in a blue moon. So that's right. kind of how I read this. Yeah, I'd also like to see, I think vulnerability management has to be kept in-house and not outsourced to an MSP or MSSP. Um, I think the other components could potentially be outsourced as well, although it'd be hard to like take something like a Kenna as an example and have a third party come in and say, well, you have this compensating control, so we're going to adjust this the other way. But for smaller organizations, that that could be feasible. Um, but there I, are, I, I like and there are, thinking about it, though. Yeah, and there are managers, managed services around that type of prioritization as well. So it does mm. exist. Not every organization is going to be able to do it themselves. Sure. We, we all know the resource limitations and gaps we have in the industry. Uh, so smaller customers who may not be able to bring those resources in, there are managed services to help with those. This is a vendor specific service versus more like a third party managed service. Um, but what they're trying to do is just Red Seal's trying to help their customers uh, be a little more efficient and they're going to help by throwing some bodies at it. That's great for them. Um, the uh, next announcement is particularly exciting for me, <laughs> actually. Uh, those uh, that have been listening know that uh, I'm involved with active countermeasures, as is John Strand and, and Chris Brenton. And one of the technologies that we built our solution on uh, is Bro. And there were a lot of reasons that, that are behind that. Um, a lot of them I questioned when, when John and I first started talking about it. And then as I, I dug into it, I really understood that Bro is the platform for collecting network traffic, right? And because of the way the technology works, it can do that at scale and it can do that very accurately. So building a product on top of that, like a lot of that engineering work was already done because it can keep up with large scale networks and because, it, especially when doing threat hunting, the timing of it all is really important. So if you were collecting packets or logs and the timestamps were kind of all over the place, it limits your ability to analyze certain types of behavior on the network. What's happened, and oh, the other thing is, as I talk to enterprises and I would ask them like, you know, what are you using to collect packets and analyze networks? A lot of them are saying like bro and security onion, like that's, that's, we're using an open source project. It was actually, it's in my talk uh, on open source security software because so many enterprises were reporting to me, this is the technology we're using uh, for this analysis, uh, which which was fascinating to me to see how that evolved in the enterprise and adoption of uh, open source. Now, what happened uh, recently is that CoreLight uh, is now the commercial entity that is uh, supporting Bro. Uh, and they raised uh, $25 million in a Series B round of funding, which is awesome, awesome for them. Yeah, and, and, and it's interesting, they, they highlight two security companies we know pretty well. Uh, Snort and Sourcefire and Nessus and Tenable, yeah. right? Is how do you take an open source co project mm -hmm. like Nessus originally, turn it into a commercial entity called Tenable? Um, same with Snort and Sourcefire. Both had uh, good IPOs. You know, uh, Sourcefire ended up getting purchased by Cisco. So they're trying to repeat what has happened in a couple other cases is take an open source project, build commercial support around it. Uh, Red Hat's another example with Linux. Sure. Uh, down this realm. Um, and so the model has worked before, right? 
Mm-hmm. The the question becomes, you know, how many people are going to buy the commercial product versus just rolling their own? And bro, we'll see how this plays out. But um, there's a couple good examples of of companies that have done it well in the past. And if Core Light can uh, repeat with a with a similar path, that it could be successful for them. And it's interesting you say that, Matt, because I I was talking to someone. I don't remember if it was on air or off air, which is terrible. My memory's going as I get older. But um, I was bringing up the concept of open source. And they said, you know, we, I, I typically, oh, it's Wim Reams that is a virtual CISO for a lot of organizations and said, you know, I, he's like, I balance open source and commercial tools when I'm recommending solutions for these, you know, suite of companies that he's working with playing the, the CISO role. And he said, I don't often gravitate towards Security Onion for doing a lot of that network analysis because it's too heavy on the resources in my organizations that I work with. We don't have the bandwidth, especially in smaller organizations that are taking advantage of a virtual CISO, right? They don't have the internal resources to implement it correctly. Now, a lot of us are thinking, well, security onions easy. Like I just take that, I stand up a VM, I mirror some traffic to it, and it's already configured for me. But as you get into the enterprise, if you dig into security onion as an example, in a production environment, you're separating those components, right? And so now you've, you've got multiple sensors that you have to deploy, and then you've got uh, head-end consoles that are doing the analysis and the architecture starts to spread out and it starts to become, a. when I looked at it, I then agreed with Wim because I'm like, yeah, when I looked at it, it is a lot of work to implement it at a, a large enterprise. And I think that's where, where Coralite is playing is saying, you know, if you don't have the resources internally to implement this project, now there's a commercial offering um, that you can re- rely on and just stand up these appliances, get, get support, get help, documentation and all that stuff. Yeah, it, it, and it's the large organizations that have the resource that can pull an open source project sure. and support it themselves. But you're right, smaller organizations are going to struggle to do this because they just don't have the resources to manage it. So, so then a <clears throat> excuse me, a commercial version of an open source project then really benefits those kind of small, medium-sized enterprises that don't have those resources. And, and look, I, we, you know, Laird Insight uses Claire. Yep. Uh, it's a core OS under the covers yep. for static um, mm-hmm. analysis of the container images. Mm-hmm. So there's there's lots of examples of, of where you can leverage open source in a commercial product that really provides benefits um, for organizations that just don't have the resources to roll their own. Now, is it a teaser as to something I talk about in my open source uh, presentation that I'll be giving uh, later this month is... One of the things that I caution people about when they're adopting open source ties directly into this into the story, right, is when you take an open source piece of software or project and you implement it and you're using it, typically what that open source project doesn't have is a dedicated team that's doing product management. And if you think about the role of product management, which I often think many of us that are in the market for security solutions today don't understand or consider the role of a product manager... I happen to, we worked at Tenable, I happen to work with some really awesome product managers and they're taking in, and tell me if I get this right, Matt, right? Product manager's job is to take feedback from the customers to also analyze the market and then go to development and build the roadmap of what new features will be added and maybe what features might, might be end of life and drive the direction of the product that directly benefits existing and new customers. Did I get that right? Yes. Yes, correct. And open source projects, they don't they don't have that role. So what it I doesn't think, exist. Yeah, it, 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 it's willy nilly. It's, it's whatever, it's whatever contributors the developer, want to put into it. So what yes. ends up happening is you adopt this open source technology, and then a feature you're using might go away or not be supported in the next version, and they might be adding features that you're like that doesn't that doesn't really help me, right? Uh, or, or, or you have to build the feature yourself. Yes, and then you have to contribute it back, and now you hope the community continues to support it and enhance it. But that's that's what that's what happens with open or source. Or you want a feature, it. you build it and contribute it back. Or you've built a feature or an extension, and it's working great, but the next version breaks your breaks integration or, or extension. Right? We we dealt with this yeah. at Tenable when we had the API for Nessus, and it was. The entire, you know, everyone working at at the company going, if we change this, how does it impact the customers? How much do we want to have legacy support? And that's all taken in consideration, which isn't in the open source world. And not to say that it's bad. It's just, it's something you have to be aware of. Yeah, you have to be aware of it. Right. 
You have to be ready to go fix some stuff on your own if you're going to leverage open source. Yeah. And again, depending on how that open source is licensed, you're also responsible for contributing back those improvements to the open source project. So, right. you know, some commercial entities don't like certain open source projects because it forces them to take some of their intellectual property and some of their enhancements and put it back into the community, which could devalue them a little bit. So it's always mm -hmm. something that people have to to be conscious of. Yeah, we, we talked about this, um, for those listening, uh, along these lines with uh, Zane Lackey from Signal Sciences, who's also a, a sponsor. Um, and it, it wasn't a product-specific uh, interview on Application Security Weekly. But we talked about this in the context of even a library, an open source library that you're integrating into your software. And so, you know, you may have to make the decision that if the person who created that open source library just abandons it, they move on to other things, it happens a lot. You got to be ready to make the decision as to whether or not you're going to take over that project or find someone else who's forked it to something else and adopt that. And if that library is critical to your application, you, you got to have some vision to say we might have to take that over someday and be responsible for all of the updates. And like you're saying, Matt, if it's licensed in such a way, re-contribute those uh, enhancements and updates back out to the community, which some organizations yes. do. And I think it's a great thing for the security community and the open source community as well. But it, it may not align with your business and you got to be ready to make those decisions. That is so true. Awesome. Well, Matt, thank you so much. Great discussion today uh, on all accounts. Thank you, everyone, for listening and watching this edition of Enterprise Security Weekly. We'll see you next time.